So our next speaker is uh, Valentin Boyana from uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and he's going to talk about avoiding the black hole information paradox with semi-classical dynamics. Please, Valentin, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Um, thank you for to all the organizers for allowing me to give this talk. And as Jose said, I'll be talking to you about how semi-classical dynamics can help in avoiding the black hole information paradox. This is a work I've done as part of my PhD thesis, supervised by Carlos Barceló, Raúl Carvalho Rubio, and Luis Garay, who will be talking later today. And it's mostly based on, uh, this talk is mostly based on these two papers here. So to begin with, uh, let me first say what I mean by semi-classical gravity, which is the theory I'll be working with. It's essentially a modification of uh, Einstein's general, general relativity, where on the left-hand side, we have well, the equations which govern the dynamics of space-time, such that on the left-hand side, we have just the Einstein tensor as usual. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, this effectively classical uh, stress energy tensor, which takes into account macroscopic matter, your stars and planets and everything like that. But also on the right-hand side, we have this renormalized stress energy tensor, which is basically the expectation value of an operator constructed from the quantum fields which reside on the space-time. In particular, for this talk, work I've done, I'm using a massive scalar field which uh, uh, to calculate this quantity, which is often used as a test field to probe effects in curved spacetimes. So this is essentially like a modified theory of gravity, but it has a clear physical motivation. And generally, the normalized stress energy tensor is small. It's suppressed by a Planck constant. And so in practice, the, it's the classical part which generates the bulk of the background and the renormalized stress energy tensor just acts as a perturbation. However, in some particular geometries, the renormalized stress energy tensor can have important uh, effects on the dynamics. And among these geometries are black holes. Now, black holes have been studied in the context of semi-classical gravity for a long time. And the standard picture of what their evolution is believed to be looks something like this. You have a collapse which, uh, in which the matter becomes dense enough for a trapped region to be formed. And uh, eventually a singularity is also formed. And on the outside of the black hole, Hawking evaporation is produced. And at the same time, the horizon of the black hole shrinks. So the apparent horizon moves inwards until eventually it reaches the origin. Uh, this picture has some issues. It's incomplete. Uh, the first issue is the fact that information is lost in the space time. Everything that falls into the black hole is never recovered again, which for the purposes of evolving quantum systems means that there's a problem with their unitary evolution. There's also a failure of predictability because at this point here, uh, singularity touches the outside universe. And well, that's not well described by uh, semi-classical theory. Now these first two issues, you could argue that they would be fixed with a full quantum theory of gravity. But uh, this final issue here, is that it take, this picture takes into account a classical background, which is incomplete in the sense that it doesn't take into account the presence of inner horizons and their classical dynamics, which could also potentially have important semi-classical corrections, just as the outer horizon does. Now, uh, classical, uh, trapped region usually forms during gravitational collapse beginning at some finite radius. Uh, from there, the outer horizon moves outwards as matter is accreted and finishes its collapse. While the inner horizon can move inwards, in the case of the formation of a Schwarzschild black hole, it just plunges to the origin where a space-like singularity is formed. 
But in the case in which the black hole has electric charge or angular momentum, then the inner horizon actually tends to stay put at a finite radius. And given that this is the case, particularly for rotating black holes, it seems to be the generic uh, situation. Although a long lived inner horizon actually turns out to be unstable classically. So under generic perturbations, uh, the net evolution of the inner horizon actually looks something in between these two behaviors where it moves toward the origin but doesn't plunge toward it in the same way it does in the case of the formation of a Schwarzschild black hole. And this instability of long-lived inner horizons is known as mass inflation and I'll refer to it a few more times during the talk. Now with this picture in mind, uh, adding semi-classical and quantum corrections can lead to several different modifications to the dynamics, which can be categorized in basically uh, three ways, uh, in three categories, uh, based on the time scale of the lifetime of the trapped region. Uh, the first possibility is that uh, the inner horizon moves inward until curvature becomes Planckian, where there's some, uh, some quantum, maybe effectively regular or is formed and the dynamics it can cause don't propagate outwards. And therefore the only source of dynamics is just the outer horizon, which uh, is governed by Hawking evaporation process. And so the lifetime of the trapped region is the Hawking evaporation time, which for solar mass objects is known to be a very long time, uh, the order of 10 to the 73 seconds. Now a second possibility is that uh, these quantum effects do propagate outwards. And it has been suggested that in these cases, the lifetime of the trapped region would be of the order of 10, of, uh, 10 to the 32 seconds. So it would scale as the square of the mass rather than the cube of the mass as in the Hawking effect, which for solar mass objects leads to a much shorter time scale, although still very long in astrophysical terms, still longer than the lifetime of the universe. And the third and final possibility is that uh, the lifetime of the trapped region is actually extremely short. So if it's linear in the mass, then it would be of the order of 10 to the minus four seconds, more or less for solar mass objects. And in the rest of this talk, in the few minutes I have left, I will briefly show you how this final possibility can be related to semi-classical corrections to the dynamics of the inner horizon. So to begin with, let's take a uh, black hole, which is formed dynamically uh, for simplicity from the collapse of a no shell, although uh, realistically a shell wouldn't carry charge, so it wouldn't generate this type of black hole, but uh, we can uh, assume this for simplifying the initial conditions and just distilling the effects which are related to the presence of horizons after the collapse. Now, if we do this and we calculate the renormalized stress energy tensor around the inner horizon, we see that it has, it's dominated by a negative ingoing flux. Now, this flux being negative, one might expect that back reaction from it would make the inner horizon do something that it classically wouldn't. And, uh, but it's also worth noting that this flux is very small. This here is the Planck length squared, so it's suppressed by a Planck constant. And uh, one might also think therefore that even if it does cause some dynamics, it will be just the same as happens for the outer horizon where the dynamics are extremely slow. However, the inner horizon has an inherent instability. And one first clue to this instability is the fact that if we, switch to uh, a coordinate system uh, in which uh, this no coordinate V here is proportional to the proper time of observers which approach the inner horizon, then this flux actually looks like it's growing exponentially quickly. And also if we calculate back reaction perturbatively from this flux in a small vicinity around the inner horizon, the effect uh, the correction on the geometry has on the inner horizon position actually 
is initially very small, but tends to grow exponentially quickly. Now, this is all based on a perturbative analysis in the vicinity of the inner horizon and the initial point of its formation. And it breaks down quickly after, due to this exponential behavior, after the formation of the black hole. But if we extrapolate from the initial tendency, then it looks like the inner horizon would uh, move outward very quickly and would meet the outer horizon in a time scale, which indeed is linear in the mass and it's of the order of 10 to the minus four seconds for solar mass objects. Now, as I said before, the inner horizon classically actually doesn't just stay put, it actually tends toward the origin. I think you have two minutes left. Okay, great. It actually tends toward the origin due to the mass inflation and stability. But for the purposes of understanding how the trapped region evolves, the only thing you need to know is that initially it makes the trapped region tend toward uh, the inner horizon of the trapped region, move toward the origin as this decaying exponential here. Now, if we once again calculate the normalized stress energy tensor on this type of geometry, simplifying the initial conditions in the same way, and we once again find that the normalized stress energy tensor has a tendency to push the inner horizon outwards, but perturbative calculations in this case aren't enough due to the dynamical background to see whether uh, the semi-classical effect ends up dominating over the classical dynamics and the inner horizon ends up moving outward or not. But we have managed in some very simple geometries, which I won't go into detail here, of what exactly they look like, but we have managed a self-consistent uh, solution, which is valid for a short but finite time after the formation of such a black hole, in which the inner horizon initially moves inwards in the same way as it does at, in mass inflation, and then uh, sourced by the renormalized stress energy tensor, it uh, begins to slow down this inward movement and uh, begins to reverse it. Once again, you see that the correction is suppressed by a Planck constant, but this is quickly overcome by a growing exponential. Now, even in the simplified geometries we're working with, uh, this solution is only valid up until the point of the bounce, from which point the picture just extrapolates from this tendency. But uh, this extrapolation would in fact be the exact evolution if the normalized stress energy tensor continued to be dominated by negative ingoing flux, which isn't, wouldn't be too strange a thing to happen. And we're working on uh, numerical calculation, which would determine if this indeed is the case. So to summarize, semi-classical corrections to the evolution of black holes can indeed become relevant on timescales which are linear in the mass due to the presence of the inner horizon. And the effect this has is that the inner horizon tends to be pushed outwards. And uh, this makes it so a region of Planckian curvature uh, may never be formed. And this in turn uh, can guarantee the validity of the semi-classical approximation used to obtain the result. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Valentin, for your great talk.